Artificial intelligence and chatbots have become a huge topic of discussion in education recently with chat GTP coming online and with all of us seeing all the ways that it can be used. It's got a lot of teachers thinking about what its role is going to be in education, but also what the role of artificial intelligence and chatbots will be going forward. And of course, many of us are looking at it like, oh, how is this going to you know, encourage my students to actually do their writing when they can have a chatbot write it? Or, you know, what's the role of plagiarism and how does that change? And, you know, it's got like all of these questions going around and um, it really stands to make a fundamental shift in the way that education looks. So what is that shift going to look like? Is it a good shift and how do we make the most of it? That's really what we're gonna cover in this uh, special video about artificial intelligence, chat GPT and chat bots. And to be able to discuss that, I've brought on a handful of folks who I respect greatly, um, whose opinions on this and whose expertise in education I think are fantastic. So with us, we have Holly Clark, D. Lanier, Victoria Thompson, and by way of asynchronous video editing, we have Donnie Pierce. Hey. <laughs> so let's do introductions real quick. Uh, Holly, can you real quickly tell us who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah. So I'm an author, a blogger, a speaker, and I've been speaking about AI little, kind of smallly, I think, in the um, when my PD is trying to warn teachers that this is coming. <laughs> we might want to think about it. So that's who I am. Awesome. D. Lanier? Name is D. Lanier. I am also an author and speaker and um, I am curious on this about this topic. If there was like one banner to hang over me, I'm like, I'm the curious one. Uh, one half skeptic, one half excited. Um, very much happy to be a part of this conversation because I think it has yeah. some deep implications. Yeah. D is like, he's the problem solving, the big thinker. Like he, that was, that was his role in that. Not to say that everybody else won't be, but like, that's, that's the big reason that I wanted to invite D to this. Victoria Thompson. Hey everyone. I am Victoria Thompson. I'm an education industry executive at Microsoft Education. Um, I am really interested in this topic because a lot of the AI that I've been used to is kind of like this, but also not really. You know, it's things to kind of solve student problems, work alongside educators. I know there's a lot of rhetoric and conversation right now about what this is going to do to assignments, uh, what, what it's going to do to also just kind of school systems at large. So Always happy to join the conversation, give my input, and also hear what people have to say as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Victoria's experience of being in the classroom and then also being an executive at a tech company, I thought was invaluable in this group. And then we're going to switch over again via vid video editing and hear from Donnie Piercy. Donnie, can you tell us who you are and what you do? So my name is Donnie Piercy. I, I teach fifth grade in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm the 2021 Kentucky State Teacher of the Year. Um, and I've spent the last 17 years just teaching elementary school, fourth and fifth grade. So excited to be here. All right. So to kick all of this off, we thought that it would be a good idea to first define what we're talking about, right? Like what is chat GPT in the first place? Because this is just the term du jour. This is just what's going on right now as we're recording this that's causing everybody to talk. But then also what are chat bots in general and what is artificial intelligence? So I'm going to start off by just kind of giving a brief definition, then ask our, our panelists to see what they have to add to it. So what we've got with chat GPT is we've got this enormous, enormous data set that's been gathered uh, where, you know, it's, it's gathered all of this information from all over the web and it's learned how to make connections with all of those things and how to be able to basically answer questions that we come up with. Chat GPT in particular is one that does it in a discussion format. So it's supposed to be like you're talking back and forth with the chatbot. And chat GPT isn't the very first chatbot ever and it won't be the last one. Um, you actually see some of these chatbots in all over the place. Like, um, you know, with customer support, a lot of times has some very rudimentary chatbots. And of course, this is all controlled, you know, in bigger picture by artificial intelligence, you know, where, um, you know, we're, where we have something like a chatbot that's learning how to respond to things based on tons and tons and tons of data. 
that's sort of my quick and dirty explanation of it. Do we have anybody in the room that wants to add a little something to that definition? I think it's important to note that with chat, G, uh, I always say like GTP, that's not it. It is right. GPT. Yes. Um, it does not have the ability to search the internet for information. So mm -hmm. rather what happens is that it uses the information it's learning from you to generate the response. And I think that's a big misconception. I've had to clear up a lot for folks where they're like, it can search anything. And I'm thinking, mm, I really can't, right? It uses the information that it gets from you in order to really generate that response. Yeah. The information that it's gathering, it's gathering from people and data. And that data can be uh, racist, it can be biased, it can be incorrect. And I watched a video on TikTok where a woman asked it about, so in it, you ask an, a query and the query is supposed to be conversational and that like, I just asked it to write a newsletter for me on chat GBT for teachers. And then I had to change the query to be like, what are some of the impacts that will be negative for teachers in the classroom? So I had to keep addressing to get the information that I wanted. But if we go back to where it's getting its information, um, this video that I watched on TikTok, the woman asked about the insurrection of January 6th, and it had a very um, <clears throat> tainted view of what happened and who was responsible or not responsible. And then she went in with her lawyer ease and said, well, that's actually not true because if you look at this law, this is what happened and this is why it was wrong and whatever. And then ChatGPT changed its tune on what it had, but it first spewed um, maybe talking points you might hear on a certain sort of news network. And I found that's very interesting and something that we have to consider because we now have access to information, but we have to be smarter than that information and knowing that it can come at us in a biased, racist, misogynist, uh, all these things way. And, mm -hmm. and, and we have to get around that first before we can enjoy the beauty of what it might bring. Yeah, that's, that's an important point. And I think the other thing also to know about it is that, you know, with this particular, and remember, we're talking about when we say chat GPT, <laughs> Victoria, I just peeked at my notes to make sure that I got the PT part. <laughs> right too. But um, when we're talking about that particular product, we're talking about one product, one chatbot. This isn't all of AI. This isn't all of, you know, what chatbots are. And it's also learning and it's also in public beta as well. You know, public beta means that it's not a finished product. And I think probably part of the reason that the creators of this put it out like this is that it wants it learning. You know, that's kind of the power of AI is that it, when it gets the more repetitions it gets, uh, the, the better, you know, whatever, however you define the words better, but um, the better it gets. And so, you know, I think that's why it's out there, why it's out there like that. So, um, yes, D. Yeah, I was just going to, I was actually going to make that same exact point. And what we have available to us right now is a research preview. So I think that also adds to the question marks that a lot of people have because it creates this, this mystery. Like, so what is this and what is it going to be? And for what purposes will it be used for? Right. So in this preview, we have sort of limited access to what its limited possibilities are in its current state. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. So let's let's start the some conversation now that we have a little bit of an idea. And of course, you know, that's just a, a very quick and dirty explanation of what we're talking about here. But let's get into uh, sort of the impacts on the classroom. And let me just ask it in very, you know, simple, plain words like that, because there's a lot of different directions that we can go with this. So um, what are the potential impacts that uh, chatbots uh, chat GPT, but also artificial intelligence in general can have in the classroom as far as teaching and learning, impacts on students, impacts on teachers, on just the entire education system. Like, you know, what, what are some of the things that are, that are top of mind for you? Who wants to cover that one first? <laughs> um, I'll go. Uh, and I think that chat GPT, uh, impacts for the classroom can be personalized learning with data that we can find out information about a student and then deliver some things that they might need to practice. But I think also we need to think of ChatGPT as an assistant. So maybe I'm a kid who's having trouble writing a paper 
And maybe I put in, hey, I need a five paragraph essay on the outsiders. Instead of looking at it like that's cheating, I think we need to look at it like that's where we can start with that kid. They can edit it. They can get more information. They can take that and they can ask better questions and they can have a bigger knowledge base rather than saying, oh, this is going to stop English teachers from having kids write papers. I think we have to redefine what that looks like in the classroom. And those are some of the impacts is that we're going to have to redefine things in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Definitions. That's the thing <laughs> I've been tweeting a lot about this today. And I keep bringing up the word definitions. Um, and I think, yeah, with, with everything, you know, we're going to have to relook at how we define certain things. How do we define learning? How do we define source? How do we define plagiarism? How do we define, you know, any and all of those things? I, I was just thinking about what Holly just shared and it kind of reminds me of, um, sort of a, a subplot from one of my favorite movies of all time. And so, spoiler, if you have not seen the movie Fighting Forrester, it's over 20 years old, so that's on you. Um, but the, the the main character, Jamal, uh, he, he begins getting uh, tutored by this sort of lost, renowned author. And uh, the author gives him a few pieces to start his pieces with. And uh, he's later accused of plagiarism. There's this whole fallout concerning it. Uh, but it kind of makes me think about that, that if there is the opportunity for work to be inspired and then continued, right? Um, if, if I'm given a, a one paragraph inspiration and then from that, that triggers a five paragraph essay or five page essay, then I think it should be questioned uh, whether or not that's a bad thing, uh, especially if there's the opportunity from the student to clarify this was the original prompt that was given to me from this query. So now we have some very deep critical thinking happening. Um, and then this is what I continue the, the conversation with completely my own words. Um, that's inspired work. And I see that as, as potential great opportunity. Yeah, well, I think a few things, Matt. First off, I think, you know, we, we need to be careful about, you know, avoiding the whole, you know, the first place that we go with this is that, oh my gosh, kids are going to just use this to cheat. Well, you know, I do think a few things about that. Like one, you know, kids have been cheating for years. Like that's definitely not like a new, new thing. Um, but secondly, like, in, in my mind, I mean, when Google Docs first came out, when teachers first saw that that share button or when Chromebooks started rolling out and they realized like, oh, my gosh, they could just Google search anything they want and copy and paste it in. The majority of them didn't. And those instances when that type of plagiarism did occur, especially at the elementary level where I teach, um, that that opened the doors to some conversations about integrity, about, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, what was it about this assignment? Was there some miscommunication on my end? Did you feel some un, un, unnecessary stress or pressure that you felt like you had to do this instead of opening up to me where I could have helped? So definitely on, on that side of it, like I think it's a concern and I think it's a legitimate concern, but I don't think it's going to be one of those, oh, the sky is falling yeah. because I do think there's a lot of things that you're able to do um, through AI and especially this, this, you know, just, the newest chat bot, chat GPT. And keep in mind, this is one of the first ones that has really gone public where people are starting to realize like, oh, this is, this is what artificial intelligence yeah. can do for us. Um, and just keep in mind, this is the first edition, right? Just like with anything else in tech, it's only going to get better. It's only going to get more accessible where you're going to start seeing this a lot. Um, you're going to start seeing the impact that this makes on education more and more over these next few years. Well, I think something interesting that we've all kind of touched on is whenever we think about the impacts of what this might mean, maybe for the classroom or students, it seems like people always try to automatically default to the negative. Yeah. And I'm, I'm the kind of person where I'm like, okay, let's take a look at the positive. So of course, this is a little bit of my bias coming in, right? Because I work for Microsoft and da, 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 da. But when I think about AI that we have, where right, we have Office Lens, 
We have immersive reader. All this lens allows students to take photos of text and send it to OneNote or Word or anywhere, right? We also have immersive reader, which actually not only translates things in live time, but can have it read aloud. For me, I don't really view it as chat GPT. I view it more as productivity and accessibility and also becoming inclusive. I also think of different products like, like Read Aloud, right? And that's regardless of whatever platform you use. I can use it on Chrome if I wanted to. I could have things read aloud to me. You know, same where if I were to do speech to text, that all has those aspects of artificial intelligence and to a degree, chat GPT. And when I think just about school-wide artificial intelligence insights, I now live in Florida. I used to live in Tacoma, Washington, uh, but Tacoma Public School District actually utilized AI powered analytics and they improved their school graduation rates. I want to say it was 56 percent to something like 82 or 83 percent. So when I think about the future of that, I think just the art of the possible. You know, yes, there are some pitfalls, but if you can get ahead of it. If you can work with your students, if you can work with your teachers, if you can work with your school leadership, let's take these tools and view it not as a net negative, but as a net positive. And I think that is where the future lies, because I mean, just look at that data, right? 56 to 83, that's massive. That That's the power of AI and chat, and chat GPT. Can't talk today, but y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, I think I think that's a, a really great point. I think, you know, the more that we have conversations like this, the more that it gets into the classroom and that, you know, teachers and school leaders and, you know, decision makers start to figure out how this fits and what it can do. Like you said, you know, you can track the data, you can track some of the best practices and everything. And then when we start to be able to replicate some of those best practices and it's shared across the board, like, I mean, that's that's how we move forward at scale, right? In the in the entire education field. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's continue this conversation. I wanted to kind of bring it a little bit more down into the classroom because um, <laughs> Victoria, you mentioned that sometimes people go in the direction of the negative, and for me, I'm trying to think of like you know the the positive. Like, where does where does this go? How does this work? Um, so let's talk about. Um, impact okay and i want to think of so i want to think about like the who and the what when it comes to this whenever ai starts to come in whenever we get things kind of like chat gpt that come around who do you see being impacted the most this could be you know particular classrooms particular um students particular teachers particular populations but then also the question is what kind of activities do you think that it impacts the most? Like what kinds of things are going to have to be erased out of teachers' lesson plans and changed probably more readily as we're starting to adapt to all of this being around? Who wants to take this one first? Hmm. They're thinking. I could go first, but I just went last. That's fine. I allow, well, I yeah. allow it. Yep, go for it. <laughs> Okay. D's like, do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to take this a little bit of a different pivot and I'm going to go with families. Yeah, so yeah. when I think about technology all up, it is one challenging when you've got multiple students or kids, like depending on how you look at it within a school system, maybe they're in different schools, maybe there's different processes. So that's barrier number one. I think barrier number two is sometimes we do incorporate this artificial intelligence and these chatbots and these things into our classrooms and our schools, but then the support is not at home. So when I think about impact, that's what my mind automatically goes to, because I have it in situations where I use chatbots, right? Like I was teaching at a private independent school about three years ago. We did a chatbot kind of like test run, which was very helpful when we were there. But when the kids went home and if they didn't have access because it was outside of school barriers, that became a challenge to not only explain to parents, but also work with students on. So that's thing number one. And then thing number two is we encountered like the is this cheating question a lot from school leaders, but we also encounter it a lot from parents and families as well. Sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect as to what things can be doing or 
what things can be done rather to enhance learning and elevate learning versus just kind of giving those answers away. And especially like if, if you follow my dad on Twitter, I know D does, he is still figuring out the ins and outs of what it's like to be on social media. He's, he's precious, right? But he'll yeah. say, I found the megaphone app and, and he'll post the megaphone emoji, right? Like, so whenever I think about that, I think about what it's like to have that kind of like generational divide where it's so new even to us. And I think about what it would be like in the at, at the family level and the community impact, because there's a lot of good going on, obviously. But even when I think about translating like family newsletters with, a, a, excuse me, with immersive reader, I did have family pushback. You know, when I think about maybe doing dictate for speech to text for writing papers, mm -hmm. I did get families put, uh, excuse me. I can't talk today, family pushback. So it's one of those things where how can we invite families into this conversation? Because what we don't want are for kids to go home with all of these resources and the families have no clue what's going on. So that's always top of mind for me. How do we involve families and school communities within this conversation? Absolutely. Well, I'll say that if we're looking at classrooms, I love the way that Victoria looked at that and, and people are often afraid of things at first and don't like want to say, uh, my kid, if they're not writing a paper, if they're not doing it, like writing right. it out or something. And if they're having help from a chat bot or they're having a help from a, anything, we have to reframe that. But I think some of the first people that are going to get scared or think of it in an incorrect way will, I think, be the writing teachers and the math teachers whose obvious um, just five paragraph essay may go to the wayside in the next 10 years. But it doesn't mean that writing itself is going to go to the wayside. And I've seen this as people have commented on some of my TikToks that like, well, they've got to do whatever. And I'm like, I'm not asking them to not write. I'm, I'm saying that what the output will be in the end looks a little different. Because what if we took two papers that I have chat GPT write for me on the outsiders, and then I go and I look at those for, for themes, for things that I want to know more about or whatever. And then I, at the end, make a TikTok or a Microsoft flip about it. And I'm talking about it to get on and talk to Microsoft flip. You have to put your thoughts into organized, um, coherent sentences before you go on there. So now writing looks a little different because the end product might be a speech rather mm -hmm. than just a paper. And so I think the fear needs to change into, wow, we can have inquiry based learning now, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. I think that's so spot on. Like if, if, if what we've done before is, and let's be honest, you know, there have been some pretty uninspired writing activities <laughs> in the past for English, for social studies, for all of that. And you said the math teachers too, like there's been some pretty uninspired drill and kill worksheets that have been out there. And if it starts to push some of that stuff out because it's too easy to replicate with a chat bot or with photo math or with yeah. you know any, any of that stuff. And it starts to push us in the direction of actually doing something with that or making it more authentic or making it more collaborative or whatever. Like maybe these are just the growing pains at the beginning of something great. That's, that's what I'm hoping, you know, we're talking about silver linings here. We got lots of silver linings people in this, in this uh, panel, well, I think, but um, that's, that's sure. kind of the direction that, that I'd like to, to see all of this. Matt, we're at Commodore 64. Oh, sorry, Holly, go ahead. You're going to get another second. We're, uh, we're at Commodore 64. You know what I mean? Like, yes. we're at the beginning of this. Anyway, Dee, go yes. ahead. ColecoVision. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were comparing our favorite old school game units. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I am still deep in thought on this. And, you know, we are, we are clearly at a pivotal moment where it is both brand new and untapped. And I just think about, well, how did, or how were classrooms quote disrupted, um, kind of tired of that overuse of that word, but anyway, uh, how were, how were classrooms disrupted when calculators were um, readily accessible to students, right? And how was advantage versus disadvantage uh, evaluated when considering some have literally the ability to type in and to receive an answer versus those who didn't um you know 
Britannica um, being available to some uh, who had the up-to-date versions and those who had only A through H and those who had none, right? Like, so we have all of these question marks, but I think that as we're in this transition moment, what is key is the opportunity for teachers to engage students in some of these ethical questions. Like, we are asking ethical questions, and I think the the opportunity that we have, I'm gonna frame it in the positive, is to engage students in the ethical discussion, right? So how do we have a critical dialogue with students around the ethics of the use of AI in the classroom? That's where I see the potential of outright advantage versus disadvantage in this point in time where there will be some schools and there'll be some teachers who will dare to dialogue with their students on these things and implement uh, sort of new rules that are constantly changing because their students are also a part of that process versus those that will make decisions uh, from the top and say, absolutely not, and here are the consequences, if so, right? So there will be long-term ramifications of students who are entering this early, not just using it, but critically thinking about the use of it versus those who will only use it to the extent that they are given permission to, uh, or those who quote cheat by using it. Yeah, quote cheat. I'm so glad you said it that way. That's so good. And I think that's, I think that's so important that you brought that up too. I've heard a lot of discussion and seen a lot of discussion about, you know, the instructional and the curricular side of it, you know, kind of like the operational day-to-day -day type of thing. But D, you're like looking at it from a human standpoint, like these are conversations that we have with students to help them to realize the world that they're walking into, which really is part of our, you know, our overall mission as educators. So... All right. Unless anybody has anything else to add, I want to move on to the question I really have been excited about having all of us get into. Um, and that one is, what do we do now? You know, how do students and teachers use that? I think this is probably where all of our hearts are, you know, looking around this, this room and Donnie included. You know, I was trying to come up with some fun, unique kind of in-class activities that teachers could start to do, whether it's with chat GPT, I know a lot of districts that already has already blocked it for teachers and for students. Right. Um, I was, but I was trying to think of just as more and more of these kind of chat bots and AI start to roll out into education. Um, I was trying to come up with like, okay, what's a unique, fun, creative way that you could use a storytelling app or a storytelling bot um, in the classroom? And probably the, the the most fun thing I could come up with, at least right now, you know, it's only been around for a week, so I haven't really had that much time to, to play with it. But, you know, Matt, if you're, you know, the game we used to play as kids, telephone, where, yes. you know, you'd start with when you pass the message, then you pass it off to someone else and they would hear it mm -hmm. and they'd pass it off to someone else. Um, I was trying to figure out like, okay, like if you were going to do something like that with a chat bot, how would the story change? So yeah. simple example, right? I went and I um, had the chat bot here in the background. You know, I just told it to write a story about a fifth grader, right? Really didn't give it any, you know, prompting. I could have told it like, hey, you know, and make sure that it has a theme of anti-bullying. Make sure it has a theme of being a good friend. Just something simple, right? Mm -hmm. Well, well, now imagine like you're in the classroom and maybe you put your kids in groups. Maybe you you pick 10 volunteers and they each have to write down something goofy. Well, remember, it's a chat bot. So in other words, it's like you're having a conversation with it. So <coughs> it's like you're having a conversation with it. So you call on the first kid. Hey, I'm going to have this retell this story now, but I want to add something different to it. So what's something different that you want to add to this story? So in this one, it looks like it's a story. Again, I haven't even read this yet because I just wrote it when behind yeah. the scenes here. But it looks like it's a story of a girl named Emily in fifth grade. She's kind of nervous about going to fifth grade. So kid comes up with a zany idea. I don't know. Um, now add a robot to the story. Right. I don't have to tell it, retell the story. I don't have to copy and paste it because it's meant to be a conversation. So I'm just going to say now add a robot to the story. 
So now it's going to go ahead and it's going to keep some of the story the same. But as it makes its way through there, eventually something, oh, as she walked into the classroom, she was surprised to see a robot standing in the corner. It was tall and sleek with shiny metal arms. And we had never seen a robot before. This is our new classroom assistant. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but you know, this will go on in the background. And what will be super fun is if you go through this 10, 15, 20 times, I mean, to one, see how the story has changed, mm -hmm. but also to compare it like, hey, based on the original story that I would put together, you know, what's changed, what's similar, what most surprised you, you know, et cetera. So anyway, still writing in the background, eventually it'll reach a point where it finishes up. But I learned you can do anything with this. You could tell it hey, add, you know, Marty McFly and Doc Brown to the story and it'll find some way to sneak it in. You mm -hmm. could say now include a time, you know, a, a vortex to another dimension and it will do it. You can yeah. say now add, I don't know, make it start snowing in the classroom for some reason and it'll find some way to, to sneak it in there. But it also keeps the original part, you know, it'll always try to keep the original story in there as well. So again, Kind of a fun creative writing story where you're still giving the students a chance to use some of their creative thinking. But at the same time, when it's all said and done, you've come up with this goofy story. And what's great is, you know, as this conversation happens, all you got to do if you want to keep a record of it, you can just go and copy it one at a time. And then paste it into a Google Doc. I mean, imagine something like this posted outside your classroom. You know, you talk about um, how stories change over time. Maybe there's a lesson there in the idea of storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, that's probably been the most fun thing that I've come up with so far with it. A lot of people have seen how it can do, um, you know, you can have it turn things into poems. Heck, I even learned the other day because I was, you know, when I, I couldn't sleep the other night, I was like, hey, you know what? I can't sleep. Let's see what I can do with this thing. So I even learned you could say like something goofy, like turn this into a sea shanty. Why not? Right. Um, and it'll take the story. <laughs> I love the ahoy there, mateys. <laughs> you know, it'll take what's been written and it'll then turn it into a sea shanty where it kind of follows a similar thing. Maybe do something like, hey, class, it's writing this one for us. What I want you to do now is take this original paragraph and see if you can write your own and then we'll compare what it's written with what you've written at the end. Um, heck, I even learned, Matt, you can tell it to have it to, to turn it into a rap battle and it'll do that too. It'll pick like two random characters in the story and they go head to head based on, you know, what you told it to do. So, that while there's definitely parts of this, you know, I think the the plagiarism thing is a definite legitimate concern and something that, you know, as educators, we've got to figure out the best way to um, to, to incorporate that into our instruction because it is a conversation we're going to have to have with kids. But at the same time, there's so many fun things that you can do with this that can provide some really, really unique exemplars um, for students to take a look at. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got anything else, like anything classroom wise, any other like examples or anything that, that you want to share? So I, um, was trying to figure out like, okay, you know, if I was going to do something like this with my, my students, right. What I learned about chatbots is they are fantastic editors, right? They are fantastic at editing stuff. So if you take something that you've written and said, hey, can you read through this and just fix some of the punctuations? You know, you can tell it specifically what to look for. You can tell it to go and look for, hey, find me five words in here and, you know, that look up in your whatever thesaurus you have and, you know, add some more deep vocabulary to it. But just a, a simple example, um, I took a piece of student writing, and again, I'll turn on the little laser pointer here because it's fun to use the laser pointer. <laughs> um, and uh, I took a piece of student writing and I fed it in and it might be kind of hard to see. I can't really zoom in on it because it's in a slideshow, but I told it, I said, read this story written by a fifth grader, but add more details, correct the spelling and punctuation. So I just copied and pasted just a little paragraph that she had written in. And then over on the right, kind of, you know, 
uh, took what the student has written, kept most of it the same, but kind of you know, added some transition words and kind of cleaned it up a little bit. So then, you know, my creative juices started flowing and I was like, huh, I wonder what else you can do with this. So then I took the edited version and I said, hey, so now take this little edited version that you did. And I said, turn this into a nursery rhyme and <laughs> took it. No kidding. About 10 seconds, summarized the story and wrote this delightful nursery rhyme about these two imaginary characters, Oliver and Giu how they were trying to search for where their sister was hiding in the bedroom. So then of course I'm like, okay, I need to keep going with this, right? You know, we're, we're going to see how deep the rabbit hole go, how deep the rabbit hole goes here. So then I said, all right, I know this is kind of hard to see. Maybe you can like zoom in some magic on your, on your, um, on your editing skills here. And then I said, well, take the nursery rhyme and now turn it into a daytime soap opera. What? Right? Why not? <laughs> Let's see what it can do. So it totally scripted it in less than about 15 seconds. It wrote out this imaginary soap opera um, where it's two characters and they're frantically searching for their sister in the house. But I'm like, okay, let's keep pushing this, right? You know, if we've come this far, there's no turning back. So I was like, let's keep going. Then I told it to add time travel to the story. <laughs> And it did it. It did like this Harry Potter and, um, you know, the time turner, how she goes back. You know, no spoilers. Sorry, if you haven't read the book, sorry, spoilers. But, you know, how she used the time turner to go back in time to figure out where she left stuff. I was, and in this story that it wrote, it basically did that. It took, you know, let's figure out where we last saw a sister and travel back in time to that. Then I'm like, all right, one more. Let's just push it one more time. Um, I said, let's turn it into a rap battle. So I tried to blow it up here a little bit so you can kind of yeah. see, like, you know, it took Oliver and G, how they're going back and forth, whatever. But wait, I forgot. I did one more thing because I wanted to see if it could, if it could do it. Because by this point, like, I had been some, become so engrossed with this, this, this story that my fifth grader just written just for fun. She's a creative writer. I said, okay, for this last one, now imagine, I apologize, it's really small, but I said, now imagine for a second that this story was uh, in a children's book and I needed an illustration for each page. Give me suggestions for what the illustrations on each page could be. And Matt, it did it. I mean, it's, it's kind of, and it did it in less wow. than 15 seconds. It put this out for me. Thinking about this as a classroom stuff, you know, if you oh. have a student who's struggling, maybe like, oh, I need, I need an artist and they don't know what to draw. Boom. Hey, we're going to turn this into a, a children's book now. Hey, you, yeah, y'all are gifted artists, right? Or you just love to draw. Cool. Um, based on what's here, you can use this if you want, or you can use your own stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, that was just pushing the envelope, trying to see like, what could you do with a tool like this? But again, it's magical. You know, it, it really is such a unique tool. And yes, I've said it a thousand times, and I definitely under, understand the concern with, with plagiarism, teaching students like, no, 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 you still have to do the work. This is just going to completely change um, how we kind of, I guess, edit and, and work with this stuff in the future. But it is definitely a tool that is going to um, shake up education just a little bit over these next few years. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But again, as educators, we are going to continue to adapt um, and figure out how we can use tools like this to really um, not only enhance the learning, but teach our students how to be creative in the most effective way. You know, how do students and teachers, and this is a big, broad question, you know, so this is like, do we, you know, do we incorporate it into lessons? Can you think of creative lessons and activities that you can do? Like, you know, big picture, how does it fit in schools? I'm just going to put it all out there and let you all take this in any direction that you, and he's like, he's struggling with this. I think like I made it too big, maybe, I don't know. So, um, so let's, let's go ahead and dive right into this. Um, who's got a thought on, and I know, I know we've all been thinking about like the, the practical implementation of all of this. Um, Holly, how about you? Can I turn to you first? Cause I know you've, I mean, all of us have been thinking about it, but like where, where, where's your mind on, on how this fits in classrooms and schools? 
So I, I, it takes me back to Kai Fu Lee, who is kind of the originator in working on AI in, in China. And, and he said on 60 Minutes once that um, AI is going to change uh, the, the world more than anything, more than, the, than electricity. And so we have this thing that we're teaching during a time when something is going to change the world more than electricity. So we can either use the heck out of it and see what it can do and play with it and see what happens, or we can shut it down and say, I'm not letting kids write papers anymore. And so I would lean toward that. I'm going to use the heck out of this and see what it can do. How can it support UDL? How can it support struggling learners? And I would just, uh, I would go crazy with it because it's actually pretty exciting that we're living in this time where now we can go beyond answering questions and really get to asking them. Mm, yes, absolutely. D. Lanier, what about you? Goodness. Yeah. So like brain overload when thinking about the possibilities. And yeah. um, I think for the three of us on here who are no longer in the classroom, I always think, how would I introduce this in my class? Like what lesson or lessons would I start to open up with this? And um, first comes to mind is a uh, popular, ed, uh, not ed tech, but tech blogger and uh, YouTuber uh, by the name of Marquis Brownlee. And so his channel, MKBHD, I watch it all the time. And I'll probably show the video where he uh, kind of tricked his viewers into um, not understanding or not knowing that he was actually just reading the script from AI. Um, and that just kind of blew me away. And it just made me think about all of the production that goes into his channel that comes from, you know, who is writing the script, who is editing the script. It's all the things that kind of only gets relegated to like theater, right? Um, you know, who is working on art and the graphics and like who are, who's producing all of these elements. And there may be, uh, you know, I think about the news and newscasting, right? Those people are reading off a teleprompter that was written by someone else. Um, and so how do we engage other forms of creative expression and it be beyond just worship of the written word. So that's what comes to mind for me of the opportunity to say, yes, there are writing prompts that could come from this, but then also what are all the other things that need to uh, come from, uh, or what can come from open AI, um, I, I, I called it open AI, uh, but uh, yes. that GPT, I know it is, uh, but what could, what could come from it that is just a piece of something which is much bigger? And how do we allow our students to participate in all of those other elements of creative expression? Um, and also, again, going back to like dialogue, maybe even having arguments. I think what Holly said earlier is like, you know, how, how unique would it be to have an argument with AI, right? Based on perspective, education, and experience. So there's opportunity, I think, that is untapped, and it would be really cool to to try it, right, without knowing the the complete end of it, but to try it. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great other direction. I yeah, this this is why I love having this panel here. Like we're all kind of taking this in different directions, and I'm curious to see where Victoria takes this one too. Where's your mind on this one, Victoria? So my mind automatically goes to the idea that. So many times, and even when I was in the classroom and when I was an instructional coach, and then also now when I work with educators and like building up pre-service teacher programs and all the things, basically, I think people sometimes are under the assumption that they need to go like Mach 5, or if you watch The Office, it's like threat level midnight, right? Like you go from zero to 100 and you are proficient from day one. I just want to reiterate that baby steps are still steps. If you'd like to use speech to text for students to begin to write their papers or write paragraphs or something, that is a really great place to start with AI. If you want to use a chat bot, maybe for like a math anticipatory set or maybe for a couple of collaborative work questions, that's another great place to start. If you'd like to utilize like translation features in order to maybe reach families during family teacher conferences, that's another great place to start. With all of this, I don't think anybody is asking for anyone to be proficient from day one. It is very much a learning process and it takes time to kind of get to your level of comfort. So it's always a good idea to just start 
small again because baby steps are still steps and once you take that leap then you can begin to see again what's possible what's the art of the possible with what you have yeah so when i think about how anyone can use it start small yes absolutely like i mean this this just so chat gpt at least just came on the scene you know just within days of us recording this and nobody's expected to be and an expert. So no, I think I think that's that's fantastic. Um, I also love what Holly was saying earlier about this off opens up opportunities for us to ask questions. You know, she she said it that way, and it made me think also like this is yet another example of what makes it, it's it's freeing us as educators up to do what we were created to do as teachers. You know, we were created to build those relationships and to, you know, use our passion to inspire students and to sit down next to them and work and to, you know, figure out exactly what they need. And if artificial intelligence frees us up from some of the day-to-day chores and some of the things that take us away from it. And even some of the things that steal our joy from teaching, if we can have some of that stuff taken off of our shoulders so that we can do the things that we were made to do as educators, I think that's huge. And then the other thing I'm thinking about when it comes to this are like the nuts and bolts of like the teachers that are going, okay, I'm in a classroom right now. I've got to teach tomorrow how in the world am I going to deal with this? You know, like if I was going to assign students to do an essay and I've got that in my lesson plans for tomorrow, what am I going to do so that I don't just have students copy pasting out of a chat bot and not engaging mentally with what I want them to engage mentally with. And, you know, I've seen lots of things thrown around in, um, you know, on, on social media and everything. Um, I personally don't think that there's any shame in doing some paper and pencil writing assignments. If you're ready to, you know, if you're not ready to do a complete paradigm shift in a matter of hours and you want to kind of go back to that, like those are still ideas and they're ideas directly out of a student's head. So I think that's one direction you can certainly go. Um, You know, doing some collaborative stuff too, where students are discussing, um, you know, that kind of thing in the right space, you know, that, that still opens you up to lots of possibilities. I think, um, you know, doing creative expressions of what it is that you've learned. If you're demonstrating learning through creative means, if that means, you know, like, uh, you know, sketch noting or, you know, creating stop motion videos or, you know, I mean, just whatever that ends up being for you. Um, You know, I think there are some of those other things where if we, if we look at it, those are some of those like stopgap things that can help us get through until we understand this a little bit more. Did anybody have anything to add to that list as far as teachers that are going, oh my gosh, I have to teach tomorrow I don't want students just, you know, like replacing everything that I'm doing. What are some things that I can do now until I learn more about this and and I'm able to switch? I just threw this on him. So I don't know if anybody has anything. So you said something that was interesting to me, Matt, that I hadn't thought of before. What if each of the kids comes to a group of three or four or whatever, and they each do a chat GBT on like uh, the theme of belonging and the outsiders, and they all come with these different papers. And then they work together to look at like what is being said here about the theme? How can we make this better? So that first one is like the mentor text. It's mm-hmm. the thing I'm starting from. Then they have to discuss and talk about and pull out and argue and say, I don't believe that about Pony Boy or whatever it is till they come together to make a better paper. Yeah. And and just reframing that. And I liked the collaborative part that you brought because that's one of the major skills for today's world. Not writing a five paragraph essay. I got to be honest with you. Right. Yeah. Like, let me, let me ask Victoria a quick question. Then I'm going to get over to D Victoria and your work at Microsoft. How often do your superiors go now, Victoria, how many, how much of this did you do completely by yourself and not with other people? Like how often does that happen? That's a good question. And now that I think about it, there has never been a moment where they ask me if I've done something completely by myself. And even thinking about the way that like every year, you know, we get like our paychecks and also like our responsibilities and whatnot. A lot of what we do, quite frankly, is directly tied to not only how we support others, but also how we help others too. 
And that's been really not only liberating for me as a working adult, but also really inspiring because I think we've all been in situations where we feel really siloed and, and we're not encouraged to seek things out because it might be seen as a sign of weakness or maybe we don't know something. And that that is entirely frustrating. Yeah. So in my role in particular, and also across Microsoft, like I know my evaluations, it's like so some of my questions are directly tied to what did I do to support other people? What kind of resources did I utilize? How did I go to places for help? So I think that ties directly into this because that's the future of career readiness. We're, we're not siloed. We have to find resources and we have to use them. Yeah. 100%. Dee, did you have something else? Yes, but I might be jumping the shark a little bit because I got curious while we were sitting here while we were talking and and I did uh, a search. It finally let me in because um, you know the the systems have been completely bogged down. I think everyone is asking uh, these these questions and going to uh, Chat GPT. So I asked the question: How do you prevent students from using AI in the classroom? That was my question, and it gave me some very interesting responses. Uh, Preventing students from open AI in the classroom, from using AI in the classroom is not necessarily a good idea as AI can be a valuable tool for learning and problem solving. I'm like, oh, you said problem solving. Now I'm, I'm curious, more curious. Uh, but instead of trying to prevent students from using AI, educators can help students understand how to use AI responsibly and ethically. I'm like, oh, that's what we were discussing a little bit earlier. Like, yes, we could do that. But what if I don't know what that is? Well, that's a dialogue um, with, with my students of how to use it responsibly and ethically. But if I don't have that all within my own, you know, resources to be able to say, this is definitely how you do it. And this is definitely how you don't. Um, this can involve, and then this is where it gave me some teaching ideas, because this now relates to what you said. That was just like, what do I do tomorrow? Because my right. instinct is, because I have negative bias and I also don't understand, and I'm terrified that uh, robots are going to conquer the world. Like, and I have all those fears, right? Uh, but I'm now asking myself the question, how do I use this tomorrow in my classroom? And all I had was a, you know, standard five paragraph essay. It then gives me an idea. It says, um, this can involve teaching students about the limitations of AI, as well as the potential risk and benefits of using it. Oh, now I have a research paper idea. I have the topic of the research idea right now. Uh, educators can also encourage students to think critically about the information they receive from AI and to verify its uh, verify it using other sources. So now I'm, I'm now I have a research project, right? So there are opportunities actually that come up that I didn't even think of, but now that I've been prompted by this, I have some ideas. And I think that would be a cool way to introduce that even to students. This is the question I asked. This is what it gave me. And then now I have five different activities that I have that I'm thinking about based on this. And then even uh, dialogue with the students. What could this assignment look like? And they start to generate what this assignment is. And then we could uh, collaboratively come up with our own rubrics of how we evaluate what our responses are in the ever, whatever form that we decide upon. Right. So uh, the question of what do you do tomorrow? I, I was like, I don't have any idea. Then I went to uh, chat GPT and it gave me some ideas. <laughs> I love that. I think that's great. This 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 part right here has been fantastic. This was the part I was really looking forward to. Is like brainstorming ideas. I want to touch on one more big question that I know lots of people have been talking about and lots of people have been thinking about. And this is one that we knew was coming. Discuss the idea of trying to shut it down. We just talked about that a second ago. Um, I've already seen some discussion about my school is actively trying to get this blocked, you know, which of course I know to all of us makes us think, well, what if they get it on their device at home? What if they get it on their phone? What if they're sitting in the bathroom stall on their phone and they decide to type it on their Chromebook before they get back to, back to class? Yeah. And, um, I also <laughs> happens, right? But um, I, I started to realize I wanted to throw this one tidbit into the conversation and hear all of your thoughts on all of this. Um, I think there are a couple of different thoughts on this. There's the idea of does it get blocked on a school and school district level? Mm. But I think that's a separate conversation from how do how do we navigate in it because i think anybody who thinks that blocking it on a school or school district level is diluting themselves 
to think that that's going to stop the problem. It's like sticking your head in the sand, right? But that is a decision that schools and school districts have to make is, is it better to block? Now, also, there's the there's the thought that the terms of service are 18 and up from what I know. I haven't, I haven't confirmed that myself, but that's, that's what I'm hearing. Um, so, I mean, there's that side of it. But there's also the bigger theoretical conversation of if students had access to it, is it better to shut it down or leave it up? And then the more important question, I think, is, you know, like, how do we navigate in the middle of all of this? I don't know. I just threw a whole bunch of things into the conversation here. But the big question, obviously, is that idea of shut it down. Who has some thoughts on all of this? I will just talk to, uh, to save the uh, blank space, but that it, that I would need to sit at a table with a bunch of brilliant minds and really talk about that yeah. because I'm not for shutting anything down, but I think that's going to be the first step. And mm -hmm. how do we frame uh, counter arguments against that? And how do we listen to the angst that people have without jumping to the like, because I'm just, a, you know, I said it, I'm like, well, I want to try it. I want to do it. I want to play with it in my class. But I, I would like to have a, a conversation. And what Dee said was dare to dialogue about that before shutting it down. Mm -hmm. Love that. Dear Victoria. I just uh, kind of, it comes back to the idea of the schools that will dare to explore it versus those that will shut it down and the disadvantages that that will create that will have long-term effects that's what comes to mind for me um and thinking about like when wikipedia was new to the scene right um there were schools that said absolutely not you can't use wikipedia and if there was technology yeah. right that you could if you could block it then it was and all that and versus other schools and other places were taught how to utilize it well, right? How to um, understand what it is, understand its limitations, understand how to cite the resources, right? So then you have this huge gap between the students that were introduced to it and you introduced how to utilize it effectively and ethically and those who were told you can't use it at all. And then on the outside of that, are those who then quote were considered cheaters because yeah. they utilized it anyhow and they were caught in using it right and there was never an open dialogue over the proper use of it and the ethics of it and how to agree on its use in its current state mm -hmm. in our current context and then understanding how gradually as we understand it how we may use it more effectively or use it differently. Um, but I, I, I hurt for the schools that say, easy answer, we have the technology to shut it down and we're going to shut it down. And, um, and I think it, not only is that unfair to the students who, okay, so it's shut down in school and it may be blocked on their Chromebooks because that's the only device that they have access to versus mm -hmm. the student who goes home uh, and has access to a personal device that does not have any of those blocks, right? Like what is that inherent um, difference that's, that's their um, advantage versus disadvantage? But then, yeah, longer term, like what about the schools that openly explore because that's where really where we are right now we're in the explore phase openly explore it versus those that no we're not we're not doing that yeah um did, will you see a difference in that area between public and private schools like if you had to guess we are know the answer to this question <laughs> right right Sorry, I'm not saying that. <laughs> right. wants to stir I mean, stuff up today i think right <laughs> no um, but the, the other thing, so I'm going to advocate, and again, we're just kind of all doing this off the top of our heads here, but just for the, the sake of a different voice and a different perspective, I'm going to advocate for the, let's shut it down on student devices on the school network for the rest of the school year. Now, I think by the, it, by the end of the school year, my suspicion is that chat GPT in particular will be behind a paywall. 
I think they're going to want some oh, money yeah. for it. And I think they're going to want it pretty quick. In fact, by the time that this video comes out, who knows, it might be behind a paywall already, but or, you're right. Yeah, I think but, they're gathering um, data still. So we probably have like a year to six months. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but I'm, I'm for, because again, it's like, it's asking the question, do we are, is this part of the solution somehow and blocking it and saying it doesn't exist is not the solution. But what I could see is we have teachers who are in this setting on a, under a certain set of circumstances and it's hard enough to be a teacher as it is. And they're already busy and overloaded and everything. And the last thing that we need to put on teacher's plates right now is find a solution to working this into your curriculum in a thoughtful way. So I could see, you know, knowing that, of course, students could go and, you know, access it on their own devices and say, let's acknowledge that this is there and that this is a possibility, but let's shut it down on the school school district for the rest of the year. And when we have some time, some perspective at the end of the school year to think about it and how this can be effectively implemented, we're going to open it back up. I wonder if, you know, I'm just trying to go like from the, you know, the theoretical optimist, we need to, you know, innovate and be forward thinking side of Matt, but also living in the same household as a practicing teacher who I know if she talked to me about this, like there's going to be, there's going to be eye rolls and big size and everything because it's going to make it hard for her to survive tomorrow. And it might eat up her entire prep period tomorrow. I think if we find a logical, fair middle ground on all of that, I mean, again, just as another perspective, another way of looking at it, I don't think that that's unfair. Victoria, did you have anything to add to this? Um, a little bit of everything. And whenever I talk to schools and districts and teachers in particular about why they don't want to do something, my pressing question that I ask at least five times is why? <laughs> So that's uh, that, that's even a practice that we have at Microsoft where you ask why five times and the answer cannot be the same every single time. Because when we ask at least five, then we can kind of get down to like the nitty gritty as to what the challenge is. So I just kind of advise for people to think about that. What's the why? And it cannot just be answered in one simple thing. Try to get down to the five, at, at least the five. And it can be a little bit tedious at times, but I think that really helps to figure out what the challenge is and what the problem is. And then we yeah. can start to problem solve. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. Yeah. This has been five wise. Five. Five wise. I like it. <laughs> Matt, if you don't mind, I wanted to, oh, yeah. uh, well, first of all, shout out Victoria. Yes, love five wise. Um, but also something that you said, Matt, actually, I, was, I found myself first disagreeing with you. And then I started thinking about how I implemented digital citizenship as a tech coach and how I train teachers. And now I was like, wait a minute, there's actually something to be said about not opening up certain features until there has been uh, training. I don't love that word for this particular context, mm -hmm. but uh, if there has not at least been, what was that, Holly? Dialogue. Dialogue, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and agreements, right? So that's the part, right? Like when there are agreements that are made in light of, and so something as small as if, you know, do you allow students to uh, post on Google Classroom, right? Uh, I say, wait, pause. No, not until we have a dialogue over their social responsibility, right? And then we have an understanding and agreement on what we will do in the event of this versus that, right? And now after we've established that, now we are opening up and there's clarity as to what our expectations are because we collaboratively created them. And so I think about that with this dialogue that we're having about chat GPT and it being an understanding and an agreement that's made amongst teachers, but also uh, if there's the ability for a teacher to have a sense of agency of, I know I want to have this dialogue with my students and I want to introduce it and I want to start to gain an understanding yes. collaboratively with my kids, then I would hate for that to be prevented from me, right, from on high. But 
if that's the case, then that's then what the case that I'm going to make for mm -hmm. how we proceed in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's right on. It's like, I mean, it's kind of like any other sort of big change that you want to make. I mean, like dress code changes, um, grading policy changes, you know, if something comes up, you don't want to just like jump right in. You want to, you know, kind of like thoughtfully go into it. And it's like you said with, um, Google classroom, do I want students to be able to post not until after we've had the discussion, you know, so maybe, maybe this is the time for, for us to have the discussion and Hey, that's what we've just been doing here, right? So I hope if you're watching this, I hope this has been as enlightening and helpful to you as it has been to me. So I want to thank our guests one more time. Holly Clark, Dee Lanier, Victoria Thompson, thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. I did that with them, with half of them with their mics off. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to, to tell you all that are watching, um, this video is going to be a part of a piece of content that we're going to put out on Ditch That Textbook about AI and chatbots and specifically chat GPT. Uh, some information about it, linking to some resources that people have already written. And then also, you know, lots of teaching ideas of, you know, how do you, how do you run class in, in light of all of that? And you can find that at ditch.link slash AI. And we'll continue to add new things to it. Hopefully some other conversations like this and then, you know, more resources and more ideas as they come together. So feel free to go check that out. So uh, for Holly D and Victoria, I'm Matt Miller, and we so appreciate you joining us and being a part of this presentation. Take care. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, y'all.